Hello, everyone. Welcome to our uh, series of uh, Longevity Plus lectures on aging, anti aging, health, and well being. We are based in Brussels, Belgium University of Brussels. And today we're going to have another um, series uh, presented by uh, Dr. Marius Griazis. Uh, I'm going to mute myself and uh, cut the video as well and uh, just hand over the microphone to Marius. Hi, Marius. Hello, nice to be with you. Um, now we are going to talk, uh, as the title says here, the fallacy of the longevity elixir. So it's going to be a two, two part presentation. The first part, I'll show that um, people could talk about an elixir in the widest um, sense of the world. In other words, a therapy or a treatment against aging. Um, and I'll show that this is, a, is the wrong logic to follow. But uh, the second part, I would um, present some ideas about how to defeat human aging by using something more abstract. So I will start and we'll see how we, how we get on. We hear many times in the press or in meetings, even scientific meetings, that um, um, people have discovered a tablet or a medicine or a drug or a, an injection that is going to reverse aging or eliminate aging. And uh, I'm saying that this is not going to happen because the cure for aging or the, the elimination of aging um, it's not going to be anything physical. And I say it again, uh, second or third time, the fountain of youth cannot be found in a touchable item. Since the beginning of uh, humanity, people were trying to find a cure for aging, in other words, not to die from aging and live um, for many years. Some people wanted to live forever, a secret of immortality. But if we look at this uh, history, we'll see that all the proposed treatments are physical items, either an elixir, a liquid, or um, some uh, magic pill, or some uh, alchemist's uh, concoction, and so on. And um, it's always an item that we can touch. It uh, never has been about uh, an abstract concept, which we will see uh, soon. Today, we use the same concept, but different, more sophisticated terminology. We talk about rejuvenation biotechnologies, either stem cells or anti senescence drugs, and many other uh, um, modern treat treatments which are based on modern technology. But the effect is the same. The, the result is that we are going to have a treatment. We are which we aim to give to the patient, so the patient won't age. <clears throat> this is something that is rooted in our subconscious, is uh, something that people believed for many years. Uh, it's, it's a bit like a medical uh, therapy. In other words, the, the treatments were given by a healer to a patient, an external healer to a patient, so that the patient can get better from an illness. And then we take this concept and make it into a wider sense um, to cure aging. I'll explain the terms cure aging, mortality, and so on in a minute. So I'm just talking about general terms here. First of all, we have to divide and separate age-related diseases from aging process itself. Age-related diseases like uh, arthritis or heart disease or dementia are diseases due to aging, due to the passage of time. Um, and I'm saying that these modern biotechnologies and other modern treatments can indeed help these illnesses. But um, on the other hand, they cannot el eliminate the background damage that happens with aging. Aging is, uh, will continue to be affecting the patient. So even if we give some treatment, it's not going to be effective. And 
I think because so many years we've been looking for such a treatment, we can't find it because uh, it will never exist in my view. Uh, only today I was reading about uh, the latest news about uh, biotechnology and we, we've seen two billionaires, Jeff Bezos and Jürgen Milner, who are putting money and research into living forever. Living forever, they mean, probably they mean fighting aging and not people not getting old. But this is the same concept as what alchemists and ancient people used to do. Again, discover a treatment, give it to the patient and the patient gets better. It's the same general concept. These treatments are not going to work because there are many obstacles, um, psychological, anatomical, biological, and evolutionary. And also, even if, they, if, even if we discovered such a treatment, this is not going to work in the clinical sense. It would be unusable by the public. But I'll explain all the reasons um, as we go along in some detail. So in other words, even if we find a treatment for the background process of aging, uh, this is not going to be useful for the general public at large. However, if we consider the matter in a more abstract sense, based on human evolution, changes in society, um, adaptation mechanisms, and so on, I think aging would be significantly uh, controlled or diminished, um, even inevitably, even if, even if we don't want it, the progress of evolution, the you know, progress of technology will um, lessen the impact of aging. And again, we'll see the different reasons and the background information about this. So I'm suggesting instead of using something physical, something that we can touch or something material, which is not going to work anyway, we should consider it in the more abstract sense. As I said, this is not applicable to individual diseases related to aging. Um, degenerative, degenerative diseases um, will continue affecting us and will continue finding therapies and treatments for this. That's not the issue. <clears throat> I'm talking about aging as, as a process that continues in the background. Um, it has been defined as uh, increased mortality as, uh, as a function of age. So we will this would be only affected by a different, more general, more uh, complex way. Uh, here is the same example as cancer. Somebody can have cancer, um, they'll go have an operation to remove it, have chemotherapy, radiotherapy, and they may be cured from that cancer. However, the process of cancer in the world, in all humanity, the loss of control of cells, of cell proliferation will continue to be a problem. Uh, by finding treatments against individual cancers, we are not going to eliminate cancer altogether. The same analogy is with um, age-related diseases, which can be cured, but not the background process of aging, the continual damage uh, that happens to our body. That will not be affected by individual therapies. And the assumptions here are uh, proposed by many biotechnologists. Um, we've seen last time Aubrey de Grey putting forward his ideas, and I don't agree with those ideas. Uh, I don't think uh, this, these ideas as, assume that the human body is like a machine, so if something breaks, we can replace it or repair it, and everything would be all right again. Um, and also they assume that if we have these biotechnologies ready, these can be used by the general public. Whereas I don't think they, can be, they will be used because there are so many obstacles. Um, I'm not going to claim that the human body is a very complicated machine because it's, it's a complex, complex adaptive system, which means that 
there are uh, emerging characteristics, characteristics that are more than the sum of the individual components. So they have more, more properties, uh, which means that it cannot be treated an, a, a, as a machine. Um, I mentioned here the principle of downward causation, which means uh, um, there are some upper level properties in any system which influence the behavior of lower in, uh, level um, in constituents. And this complicates the whole concepts of uh, the, the whole concept of seeing human body as a machine. Just to mention a few examples of the complexity of, uh, of our body. Um, people say uh, we would um, control signal pathways, but they don't realize that this is a very, very complex system. Uh, there is individual crosstalk between different components, um, evaluation of responses. The whole thing is dynamic and changing. Somebody uh, calculated that there could be up to 2 billion different uh, configurations of a single signal receptor. So how do we find which configuration is the correct one so that we can repair it? And it's easier to talk about, to, to think about these receptors, not as clockwork devices, but more like a, a probability cloud, something that changes with time. Um, and it assumes it's like a cloud, it changes, it's, it's not a mechanical device. And many students consider the DNA itself to be, when they study the DNA and they see the, the, the photographs and the figures, they consider it to be like the, the picture I have here, a simple picture. Um, but of course, it's not like that. It, it, it changes, assumes different states depending on the on the time of day, on the organism um, uh, development, and the state of health of that organism. And it's more like this. But even this is just a general figure to show you the complexity of the DNA. How do you start dealing with it? So. Uh, some problems with translation of uh, of any treatment, any, and I'm talking about any treatment here, stem cells, drugs, pills, uh, procedures. There are considerable problems into translating into clinical practice, into the patient. And this is um, something that we'll discuss again in a minute, but we there are no protocols at the moment. So we don't know which patient to address. Are we going to address an old patient who is healthy, an old patient with different diseases, a young person who is healthy, and which organ to concentrate on? Here, um, I'm talking about um, stem cells because it's uh, one of the favorite treatments being proposed. So using stem cells in the human body, it's not as simple as it appears because the cells in, in the human body uh, are, are in networks, they are called small words. In other words, information can reach any cell within this um, network by passing through a, num a small number of other cells. In other words, the information propagates very easily. However, aging, the process of uh, aging and the damage that is caused decreases the, the, the bonds between the cells and the pathways between the cells. So information doesn't pass easily from one cell to another. And this has quite a lot of problems for the, for the stem cell therapy that is being proposed. This is just an idea of the small words. In other words, cells connected between them with strong bonds and weak bonds. Information passes from one cell to another, either easily or with difficulty. As I said, aging causes deletion of links. 
uh, damages the cells themselves. Um, and therefore, information doesn't spread through the network. And we have clinical dysfunction. Basically, that's what it is. Broken down um, links between cells. So if we go to repair the cells, uh, we have many, many different problems to face. For example, um, if we repair cells that are weakly connected, they are not they are not very strongly connected between them. The result would be different if the cells we are repairing are strongly connected. So again, it's another problem here which hasn't been addressed. We see for the from the simplified figure here, A, B, C, D, and E. These are representative of cells which are connected between them. If aging eliminates E, damages E, and eliminates E, as an example, and we go to repair and replace e, cell E, um, we may replace it and put it in place, but the bonds, the links between the cells, who is going to care? Uh, so we won't be any better off if we just um, replace the damaged cell. So that's some of the initial problems we face. But if we move on to the practical aspects, the clinical aspects of the procedures, um, again, using the example of stem cells, uh, I hear many scientists saying um, stem cell therapies are very promising and we would use them and any damaged cells due to aging will be replaced and we will be better. Okay, how are we going to replace them? The actual technique, it hasn't been properly defined. One technique is through bone marrow transpa transplant. There are other techniques, maybe intravenous use, but let's use the example of a bone marrow transplant and see how complicated it is to use for the people at large. First of all, we have to harvest the cells from the from the person from the patient harvest them is the autologous cell harvest and again it sounds okay yeah we harvest them but what does this mean for the patient they have to go to a clinic have a physical examination get colony stimulated stimulating factor injections which may need to be taken every day for two weeks so they have to learn how to do it at home, learn about the side effects of this injection, just to stimulate their own cells. Um, some may need chemotherapy. Um, the anesthetic will carry its own risks. They have to spend three or four hours under anesthetic for the harvesting process. And this may need to be repeated up to five days so that to get enough cells then recover from the anesthetic, go home. The scientists treat those harvesting harvest cells. And then the patient returns to have the operation, to have the injection of those cells into the bone marrow. Again, full day assessment, preparation, IV lines, and so on. Um, if the procedure that is not successful, it has to be repeated. The patient has to be uh, has to stay in hospital for maybe up to three months on some occasions. And then after, when they go home, they have to, um, to have a period of follow-up for one or two years, depending on the procedure. And this involves all the associated things like nutrition, home care, doctor's visits, and so on. Even if the cells are injected, um, like the induced pluripotent stem cells, they are injected, say the patient had the procedure. Uh, we don't know if these cells uh, will uh, go to the proper place and assume the role that they are meant to do. Um, they, because this process is based on stochastic elements, random elements, we cannot predict the outcome. And this may mean that the procedure may uh, be, have to be repeated 
or it may have several other side effects, let alone the standards, the protocols, the permissions from the hospital, uh, issues like cost effectiveness, um, regulation, procedure. So this, this is uh, something we need to consider. Um, one other possible therapy, uh, apart from the stem cells, is to clear uh, abnormal material from extracellular spaces through vaccination. It has been proposed that we give, if we discover a vac vaccine, which we give to the patient, and this we, will clear and unblock abnormal material from the extracellular space. But then again, we have the technical obstacles, clinical obstacles, ethics, um, Will it be mandatory or not mandatory? If we are talking about eliminating aging, so this is one therapy that could eliminate aging according to some proponents, then we have to treat a lot of people, many, many millions, not 20 people or, or 100 people. Uh, otherwise, the therapy would, won't be worth it. So, we have to have questions about mandatory vaccination. And we've seen the problems with uh, the example of COVID, uh, which caused a lot of social, ethical, and political problems. The other therapy is tissue engineering. In other words, we take tissue, we engineer it, or 3D print it. Could be bone, skin, or heart. And then we put into the patient, but these are just words. How do we put external tissue into a patient? Again, we have to have operations. We have to have qualified surgeons to do this. Um, we have to consider immunosuppression. Um, after the operation, they have to have rehabilitation and a lot of other treatments. And this could be for one tissue. So somebody who has say, uh, damaged heart due to aging, and, and let's assume that we repair it. What about the brain? The brain is aged as well. The bones are aged. So how do we, how do we address all of these uh, different organs? Start all over again, tissue engineering. Now the treatment is gene replacement. We find a gene that is damaged or is uh, is associated with aging, or it doesn't protect us against aging. So we say we'll take it out and replace it. Again, these are just simplistic approaches. How do we do it? Um, apart from the clinical problems, patient going to the hospital, starting all over again, uh, maybe the gene that we insert may not assume the normal function. It may not connect properly with other non-gene factors, cells, or pathways, or receptors. Uh, so these are open questions. They haven't been addressed. So how can somebody say, I'm doing research on a gene for aging without addressing all of these problems? Um, the vector, how do we inject the gene? How do, to take the gene from from the outside inside to where it has to be. Is the vector has to be discussed. Uh, they have side effects. If we use nanotechnology, this itself has its own problems. Uh, we may need to repair, to, re to repeat the procedure, the danger of infection, cancer, and so on. So again, with nanomedicine, nanoparticles, we have very, very, limited information regarding this. We don't know how to how, how many side effects there will be, the toxic effects. Uh, there's been some suggest suggestions about using inhalation of, of nanoparticles. So take a deep breath, nanoparticles go into the lungs and treat, treat problems in the lung. But how do we know that this cannot go into the body to the rest of the body and cause systemic toxicity, or it may go through the neuronal route up to the brain and cause toxicity there. Nobody knows. So how can we suggest this, um, 
this approach, we don't know the side effects of it. So all of these therapies have to be given to people. Uh, bring here the, the example of dialy renal dialysis, and which is approximately, I would say, the same kind of procedure procedural difficulty for us, the um, stem cell injection. The patient has to go into a hospital, have treatment for hours and then come out. Currently, we treat only the 0 0.03 of the Earth population. We have the facilities to treat these people. But if we find a treatment for aging and we need to treat a lot of people, many people, even 10% of humanity, how are we going to manage logistically to do this? And with the bone marrow example, uh, we calculate that instead of 60,000 bone marrow transplants, who, which we are able to do currently, we need to provide 70 million transplants for just to treat one percent of all humans. These are silly numbers. We, we cannot. We cannot actually do it. And again, if we, if we consider treating more than the 10% of the population, how, how can we say, how can we claim that we, we found a cure for aging and it can be used by the people when all of these obstacles and problems are there? Uh, I think it's impossible to treat large numbers of people more than the numbers we can carry, currently treat. Look at how many people. Anyway, uh, if we consider drugs now, tablets, in other words, not genetic therapies or, or biotechnology, uh, there are different tablets being proposed. Metformin is a good example. NAD is, is another example. People read about this and they say, ah, a new pill for, uh, for um, longevity, living longer, living forever, immortality. And they use all of these terms, uh, which in fact don't have, don't make any sense. We still don't know the side effects, the combined side effects of all of these drugs. It's unlikely to be one pill that will, will do something. It'll be a combination of pills and combination of therapies. We don't know how these combinations would work. Um, the pharmacodynamics of it haven't been studied. It's impossible to predict. So it's not a simple matter of giving one tablet and expecting the same return uh, afterwards. There are many different parameters that make it very, very complex. And then coming back to the patient, who is to say that the people will take this treatment? Maybe uh, they won't take them. Uh, we see examples from uh, life-saving therapies, heart medication, for example, 20% of people who have heart problems and are at risk of dying, they don't take their medication. With the AIDS example, there are up to 35% of people who have AIDS who don't take their medication, which is life-saving. And the reasons for this is uh, there are many psychological problems which are present in all the people. Um, if, if all the people are going to be treated with these drugs and they have depression or co cognitive problems, how do we expect them to take them, these drugs? Yeah. And one thing we need to consider is that this treatment, this theoretical treatment, if it is here, it has to be given forever. If we are going to live an indefinite period of time. So the treatment has to continue indefinitely. What are the, the problems associated with this? These are different um, stages that um, the, the laboratory discovery has to go through in order to get to, to clinical level. We have to consider the ethics of all of this. Uh, 
um, data, patient information, professional care, protocols, um, outcome assessments. Uh, and these are just some examples I'm, make, um, I'm discussing here. And I already said that this would be simultaneous. So in theory, it would be stem cells together with pills, senolytics, for example, or other therapies. Um, the combination of this continuing forever indefinitely is fraught with dangers. We have to consider a psychological problem, another psychological problem, which is um, called death drive. Is, uh, this is um, a Freudian aspect of, uh, of life, of psychology, and is um, the, desire, the desire to live and create and be creative and the desire to die coexist in our subconscious. So who is to say that um, the people would um, decide subconsciously without knowing it and without being aware of it, decide that they don't want to take the treatment or continue with the treatment or uh, co consider different treatments. It is a, a deep psychological death drive which uh, pushes people to die instead of continuing taking their medication. Therefore, we come now to the question, if all of these problems, therapies and approaches are, in my view, wrong, isn't it a good idea to start looking elsewhere? Um, you know the, the joke with Nasreddin Khoja. Nasreddin Khoja is a wise fool uh, present in, in the Oriental uh, societies and Cyprus as well, who, who does some silly things sometimes, and sometimes he does very clever things. On this occasion, he lost his key one dark night, his front door key, and he went under a light and he was looking for it under a light. This is called the street light effect. Somebody said to him, uh, have you dropped your key here? He said, no, I didn't drop it here. I dropped it somewhere in the dark, but I'm not going to look for it in the dark. I'm looking for it here because there is light. And this is the same analogy with our approach to aging now. It's convenient to look for pills or genes or cells. It's convenient because we have the technology to do that. But it is the wrong place we are looking. Therefore, now I'm, I'm going to say a few things about the general how evolution and how the progress of humanity uh, is going to have some relationship with blocking aging or, or, or eliminating aging some, some individuals. We use a system thinking, in other words, gen, general zoom out of, pro, of, of the process. Don't use any uh, reductionist concepts. Uh, zoom out and see the matter as uh, as, it, as it develops with as, um, associated societal and cultural and technological components. We know that if we study a biological aspect separately from a social aspect, uh, we may find different results than studying the two aspects together, biology and behavior and, and society. If we, if we study this together, the result uh, will be something more complex. So just dealing with the biological alone is, is not enough. We need to see the, the, the context of the human, where the human is in the world. I've mentioned, I've mentioned before the patient and the doctor, the doctor in, uh, in the first two circles. The doctor is one and the patient is separated in, in the other part. And the doctor gives something to the patient to cure him. Um, but this is, this, this is associated with all the problems that you mentioned before. 
even if the doctor approaches the patient and gets into the patient's environment, the result is still the same. We have to have a more complex um, uh, perspective, different interacting uh, observers in this occasion, different interacting concepts, so that we can find a better solution to, to the, this general problem. We have to consider the direction of evolution. There is quite a lot of research now showing that evolution moves from something simple to something more complex. Um, there is a propensity in evolution. I don't know the reasons, but that's what it appears to increase complexity. Increase complexity means in our uh, case, increase functionality and therefore increase survival. Therefore aging, is being, uh, whether we like it or not, it's going to be uh, reduced in uh, importance only due to the trajectory of this uh, evolutionary path. We know that aging is uh, associated with loss of information. Therefore, the issue is that if we increase the information in our, uh, in our environment, would that make any difference into the in, into our presence in this world, into into our health? I think it would, because if we increase information, we counteract what has been lost through aging. We see here some general uh, figure: of disability increases as we age, and. This is because the stimulation, the external stimulation is being uh, reduced as it is, as our society is now. But if we increase the external stimulation, this makes our system more complex and more robust and uh, disability is reduced. In other words, um, we are able to function for properly within a society for much longer. So an individual who helps the whole system, the entire system develop and be healthy and be strong, then this individual is useful to the, this system, to this network. Therefore, this, this, this individual will be through different mechanisms retained for longer. Translating uh, this into aging, um, if, if some, uh, some person I'm talking in general terms here, not just one individual person, but if somebody helps the whole humanity develop and evolve and be more robust, then it is more economical in energy terms for uh, nature to keep this person within the system. In other words, keep repairing him rather than allowing him to die and create a new baby who will be Re, reinstated in this network and assume a good function again. That's why I propose the indispensable hypothesis uh, based on the uh, disposable soma theory of aging and of Tom Kirkwood. This is the indispensable soma, it's the opposite. Our body becomes indispensable in, within the network of humanity. And therefore, it will be retained for longer, which means it won't age and it will function for longer and live for longer. And one way this can happen is through uh, reallocation of resources from the germline. The germline has full resources to be immortal, uh, in, uh, say again in general terms. Our germline, DNA, and uh, in, the in the sperm and in the ovaries has all the resources necessary to continue uh, living without being affected by age. So these resources may be reallocated from the germ line to the soma if, only if, we are, um, we are to become useful agents within this system. And how do we become that? 
we are exposed to information constantly. Think about our everyday life now. We are exposed to constant amount of information. And I'm talking about meaningful information, which uh, makes us to act on that information. This is a very good type of information, which um, stimulates, um, we we'll say, activates the neuronal, the neuronal stress response, makes our brain work hard in a hormetic way, not over a certain uh, level. Uh, and this means that the, the cell, the, the neuron, has to be repaired somehow. If we expose ourselves to constant information, this is a, a matter for the neuron to deal with. Therefore, the neuron has to be repaired, and any age-related damage has to be repaired too. These are general mechanisms which need clarification, but it's a general concept which I think makes sense. If we, uh, if we, if we have to deal with this information and process it and act on it, that means the cell, the neuron, the neuron in the brain has to function at full power. And where is this cell going to find the resources? It's going to find the resources from the germline. I'm claiming that, that this information assimilation process will force the, germ, the germline to give up resources to the neuron. So the neuron becomes stronger and is able to uh, deal with the information onslaught that is being exposed to. Therefore, if the neuron lives longer, the associated cells, liver cells, heart cells, and so on, they live longer as well. And this means that our entire body lives longer. It means that there won't be any reproduction. Here, the biology that I'm describing is uh, not about the reproduction and then aging and death, but information and somatic lo longevity. We live longer, but we, the reproduction will, uh, will actually go down. And this is something we see in all modern societies now, as uh, the, the cognitive and uh, societal sophistication increases, fertility goes down. Uh, it's basically a war of trade-offs, I call it, because they, these agents, the, the neurons and, the, and the, um, the germline cells compete for resources. If we force them to compete for uh, resources that are needed to deal with everyday modern technological society, then there should be a shift from the germline to the neuron. So I mentioned the neuronal stress response, which creates different uh, sensors, molecules, and other molecules, which are in direct competition with the germline. Therefore, if we act in a hormetic way to activate the stress response in the neurons, um, this would um, protect the neurons, repair the neurons, and cause resources to be diverted to the neurons. Um, I will leave the seven fallacies of aging here. I, I, we can discuss them later, because I think it's better to have some discussion. So in practical terms, what do we need to do? How to increase information exposure, information that is useful and meaningful. Uh, I mentioned a few examples here. Basically, it's information that requires action. We get information that makes us act. And this is to live in an enriched environment. Um, being exposed to hormetic challenges, uh, have meaningful hyperconnectivity. We should be hyperconnected socially, real in real life and in virtual online environments. 
um, and have a behavior which is more like goal seeking. Um, try to be excellent in what we do and try to act on uh, as much as we can in our life. And also creativity, novelty, and avoidance of routine. These four um, general subjects, I think, will increase our exposure to meaningful information and therefore activate all the stress responses in the, in the brain necessary to um, get resources for repair of the neurons. So therefore, in conclusion, I presented my view that age-related um, degeneration will not be eliminated through a physical object, an object that we can touch. There are different, uh, there are different problems associated with it. Um, Newtonian mechanics, uh, reductionism, uh, um, failure to see the body as a complex adapt adaptive system and so on. And the proof of this is that we've been looking for tangible therapies for so many decades and we haven't found any yet. Instead, if we consider the human body as part of an evolutionary trajectory, um, obeying natural laws which push our evolution towards a higher complexity, intellectual cognitive complexity, then we can see that there could be mechanisms which will diminish the importance of aging. And we come to the, where we started, live longer, live indefinitely, I would say, without the presence of aging. We may die from other things, other reasons, but we won't die from aging. That's the general uh, um, idea of this uh, anti-aging therapies, let's call them. More information, you can see the website here. It has quite a lot of information and on, on the surrounding subjects as well. Um, these are my general ideas and I'm happy to discuss them. Okay. Well done, well done. <laughs> I will leave this um, slide here, which uh, gives us practical uh, guidance on what to do. It doesn't do any harm to follow this advice, but uh, it's there for whoever wants it. Thank you so much, Marius. Very interesting indeed. I, uh, I was also reminded of my own uh, thinking when I was doing my PhD, connecting resilience and how you can design a resilient system. And something that was so obvious to me was that um, some, uh, the interface between agents and the environment is uh, where, um, uh, where, where there a lot of information exists and it's really neglected in designing resilient systems and, um, and also triggering adaptive response. Uh, so I am pleasantly, not surprised, but very happy that to, to see that indeed there are um, kind of same lines of thoughts. I can see um, them here. Um, before starting the conversation and exchange of ideas, I just wanted to, um, to ask people who are watching us on YouTube to, to, sub to subscribe to our channel, uh, Claire Veyu's uh, YouTube channel and uh, like, and comment on these um, lectures because we read all of them and also they help us to understand what kinds of um, questions you have and if we can cover them in other conversations. Um, and then moving on, um, I made some notes um, before starting kind of uh, the discussion and passing through the others um, participating in this conversation. Um, so what I uh, picked up from your conversation, uh, from your uh, lecture, uh, Marius, was that it seems that uh, we have some kind of a longevity pharmacy within ourselves that we are getting to know it and we are about to kind of discovering it. Um, uh, so are we as evolutionary beings and also as complex adaptive um, 
uh, organisms uh, forced by evolution to to basically um, to tap into this uh, longevity um, intrinsic longevity resources is it a right kind of thinking yeah i think so yes because this is common sense we see that evolution always tends to to more complexity to more cognition uh, if we if we see how we started life, we started as amino acids and so on, proteins, then uh, microbes and so on. Now we are we are agents that can think um, tremendous things. So this is the, the direction of evolution, as I call it. Therefore, if we, if we accept this, it means that somebody who is who is part of this trajectory they, they will there is no sense in killing him and causing death to this mm -hmm. to this person but why why do people die at the moment they die because from aging i mean not from other causes they die because there are not enough resources repair resources to repair all the damage that happens with the passage of time but if if we if we um, take these resources from the germline which we know that they have them and we know that um, the germline repairs itself continually then we could have those benefits instead of our um, sperm and eggs mm -hmm. therefore we would live longer because we are active and indispensable within this system and but we won't have children which will need to be re-established re within this already established uh, network i don't know if that makes sense uh, it does it, it changes everything basically that we know about biology I just hear my own voice coming back. So I wonder if anyone micro, if you can, uh, uh, okay, so I think it's now better. Um, so you also mentioned about this, um, uh, some of the strategies, for example, Lana, you have it on slides also uh, in rich environment. Uh, what does it mean an enriched environment? I mean, we know the meaning literal in literal sense, but how much of enrichment or are there measures to really help us to understand the degree to which this enriched environment or hyper meaningful hyperconnectivity would help us to create a, a, a balanced trade-off between um, the germlines and the neuron uh, shift of uh, uh, exchange that you mentioned earlier in your slides? I think it will have to be hormetic, in other words, not, not too little and not too much. Um, Suresh will tell us about hormesis, but um, the, the exposure and the, and the activities we have have to, to be up to a certain standard, up to a certain level. I can't tell you how much it would be this level because it changes from individual to individual. But in general terms, it would be up to the point where we start feeling somewhat discomfort. So if we do something and we enjoy it, we continue doing it. If we start feeling somewhat, uh, feeling a bit discomfort and uncomfortable with that activity, that means it's too much and we need to stop. So the same, an enriched environment, say we can put color in our houses or in our cities, something that changes all the time. Mm -hmm. But if that, if that makes us feel good, then it's good. It's good for us. It's good for our biology. If it, if it is overwhelming too much, then it's not good. Uh, so at, a, at an individual level is the comfort. If we feel comfortable, we do it. If we start feeling uncomfortable, then we stop for whatever activity we do. It somehow reminds me of this uh, flow theory of uh, Mihai Csikszentmihalyi that he offers a, uh, I don't know if uh, if everyone or anyone here, like I think you're all 
familiar with, uh, I presume that uh, familiar with uh, uh, the concept of flow theory, how you define a flow in your experience that is, you basically feel uh, absorbed by the experience that of work or artistic uh, activity or what, whatever it is that is um, absorbing the person's attention. So it somehow has that dynamic of what is the task and then how to design it that is be a little bit above the or below or above basically person's skills and, and how that person can really channel the flow of attention in that direction. Would it be some kind of the same dynamic or some kind of qualitative diagram that we can have, for example, with this uh, enriched environment and hormetic challenges? It is the same, the same principle. Uh, principles are, uh, are natural and, most, and universal. So one can think of it in one angle, the other from another angle, but the general idea is the same. The flow, for example, is an ideal state of mind which makes the individual become stronger, more resilient. Uh, what, that's what I was talking about. I just want to now ask uh, you guys, if you want to ask a question, please uh, do so uh, I with myself. Um, or if you don't want to ask your question directly, you can write it in the chat box. So I read it and then I ask Marius. Elias, Ilya is raising his finger. Ilya, you should ask something. Yes, I really want to raise a few points. Uh, you know, one general and a couple of empirical. Uh, so uh, the general point, uh, definitely, uh, the, the, let's say, vulgar reductionism is very problematic. We shouldn't expect uh, life extension from any pill or um, some substance uh, reduced or um, added uh, to us, uh, not even at the whole organism level, but even at the uh, individual cell level, as some people uh, presume, definitely. But I think also uh, a holistic approach is also not unproblematic. And uh, here we come to the problem of uh, measurability and um, uh, Operability. Uh, the more you uh, absorb, uh, the more elements you absorb into the system, the, the more difficult it becomes to measure. The more difficult it becomes to to, to handle. Uh, so, okay. Um, uh, in, in addition to the body, we have the mind, and then the environment, and the society, and the cosmos. Uh, the, the, there's no way we can handle it. So um, it's 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 also not uh, not a, a cut and dry. Uh, we're either that or that. Uh, probably some kind of combination. Uh, maybe maybe possible or you know recognizing the, the limitations of both approaches um, so if you would like to comment and I have a, other couple of empirical um, uh, points I wanted to raise later maybe okay there is no doubt that reductionism is useful it's not I'm not uh, eliminating altogether reduction is is useful so that we can understand certain basic things uh, but uh, to use it only as an approach to aging, I think it's, uh, it's not useful. Uh, and the same with the, the problems of, uh, of a complex system that you mentioned. They, they are real problems and they are there and we have to deal with them. Um, I think a combination of both approaches would be more, more effective. Uh, and there is a lot of work that needs to be done in quantifying the level of, uh, of complexity we need to apply. Uh, but it is, it is a general idea. Uh, it's very difficult in my view to quantify something because how, how do you know how, how long to apply a particular stimulus? We don't know. But in general terms, I think a combination of both approaches would be most useful. Indeed, uh, the, 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 the second point, uh, definitely the big problem is measurability. How do we measure, how do we quantify because otherwise it's a bit outside the realm of uh, measurable science. And if we go into the realm of measurable science, we really have to look at conditions. Uh, I, it seems to me that, uh, that uh, uh, the, the increasing complexity is not a given. We'll have to look uh, at conditions where it indeed happens and where it doesn't. 
Uh, for example, we obviously now bombarded by huge amounts of information of stimuli. It doesn't look like it uh, improves us very much, maybe even degenerates us in some way. So we, we really need to see what, what kind of stimulus and in what amounts are really useful for us. And also in terms of uh, being useful for the, um, for the society, obviously it's altruistic behavior, being useful society is altruistic. And we see that altruistic is not rewarded um, not just that you don't uh, live for posterity, but actually you yourself may be burdened at the stake. So uh, the, we really need to see uh, what uh, what kind of uh, what kind of condition, what kind of measures we, we can apply for for each uh, for each path. Yeah, um, the issue of being exposed to a lot of information, a lot of which may be not may not be useful, is a real one. But I think people can um, understand what's a useful information and what isn't. Information that makes you act on something. If I say to you now, go and read this paper on chapter such and such, you'll go and do it and it's, it's going to be useful for you. But if I tell you that my cat today came home at three o'clock, it's a, an information that is not useful for you. So people can judge generally, um, but the, the issue of usefulness, I don't mean social usefulness. I'm not, I don't mean to go out and help society. I'm talking about as a, as, as a person who has a place in humanity. Um, if many people increase the useful information for the system, if, in this example, if many people transmit information that is, is going to be useful, say, go and read that particular paper that they told you, if, if this information spreads, that means the information content of society improves. Therefore, uh, these people play their part in increasing the complexity of society. And they come under the auspices of uh, the direction of evolution. Uh, I'm not saying individuals should be useful or 10 people to be to do volunteering. It's their actions, their whole life, how they deal with the information they receive and how they improve the evolution of the humanity at large. So there is some small difference. I'm not talking about altruism, not to go and kill yourself or somebody else. You are useful as, as an agent within a system. So okay. say, for example, as an example now, I say, um, the lamp that illuminates your screen on your computer, if that goes, the whole, the whole system would go. So that lamp is useful and has to be strong and last for, for many years. Um, there is no point of putting lamps that will die quickly because the whole system would be affected. But if the the number one on your uh, keyboard becomes a bit fuzzy uh, doesn't matter you can still do it it's not a useful thing to the whole of the system that's how i see usefulness not altruism okay. i hope it makes sense uh just um, before yeah. moving to yeah. Before moving to to uh, to Suresh's question, I wanted to to just add here that what uh, the exchange between um, Ilya and Marius reminded me of uh, um, the triple test of uh, Socrates that he has uh, the triple filter test um, that uh, Socrates basically offers as a way to to basically eliminate the unnecessary information such as like information that is. Uh, or either superficial information or is an irrelevant information to be shared with, a, with another human being or another person and um, give this um, information, like ethic behind information that is being shared for it to be useful for the person that receives that information. Um, I think that's uh, also a very interesting uh, take on uh, the responsibility of our cognitive, um, uh, basically input and output, and also how we're thinking and how our thinking and being contributes to the, to the bigger um, system as, as a part of this complex system. 
Um, Suresh, I know that you wanted to ask a question, so I hand to you now. No, I don't have a question, just some comments about uh, Marios is a nice lecture. I uh, agree with almost everything you say, Marios, uh, especially your critique of reductionism, uh, which has done a tremendous job in the last few hundred years in dealing with specific problems. Uh, but the questions like aging and those where the processes are involved, that's, a, that's beyond a reductionistic approach, and especially the paradigm of uh, body as a machine does not work. But the thing is that your other criticisms, which were mostly about the technical aspects and the implementations. Now, those are actually, some people will like to say, look, human beings wanted to fly right from 100,000 years ago. It took them 100,000 years, but they were able to fly. Yeah, so, so that's the technical part. And there are people with lots of money in the world at the moment who are, putting that idea that if we put enough money and enough manpower, we will solve the technicality. And there are a lot of people who can see a lot of money coming from that kind of approach, and they are pushing those agendas of individual target thing. So, but whereas, so, so that critique becomes less actually uh, important to affect the direction of research, because that just says that, okay, that's how we implement it, when we need that. But your other part, that yes, we have to go in other way of thinking that body is not a machine, but then what is it? Yeah, so your information theory, I will have to still think about it, that it will evolve and then our germline repair system can be hijacked towards somatic cell. Uh, oh, that way there are examples that yes, if you castrate uh, men, they do live longer. Is that the same theory? So, um, so castration will not be ever uh, acceptable way, either knowingly or unknowingly. But, uh, but overall, what you have done is you have brought attention to some of the important points that the question here, which we need to do is that, okay, could we live indefinitely? Would we live indefinitely? And should we live indefinitely? Why do we want to live indefinitely? I am a great supporter of immortality that yes, potentially I should have the possibility to be immortal, but I should also have the choice of dying whenever I want. So death by choice. So, because that takes away a lot of other pressures. So we should have some magic pill for immortality, which might not come today. It might come in 4 million years, naturally, or by technology. But I would like to have the choice of dying if I want to die, and choice of living if I want to live forever. But at the right now, there is money. Everywhere is all the money giants who are pushing the things. The example you showed of uh, Bezos and Milner, they think we can put a lot of money and sort out. Well, good luck to them. They have money to spend, whether they go to space or they do this ever. Good luck to them. But you did a reasonably well well done job. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. That's what well, that it is. could be a publicity stunt for these people. <laughs> yes, <laughs> definitely. That draws attention a lot of it. The, the issue being, a, being if, you, if you want to die when you want to die, uh, I think it's easy. Just uh, stop taking the medication or the treatment and then you die. But you raised a very important point here about living indefinitely or living forever. Um, my point is not that I want to live forever. Nobody cares if I live forever. Um, the point is that I'm trying to address here is age-related degeneration, because aging causes de degeneration, diseases, and dysfunction. Uh, this, uh, therefore, if we take away aging, people will be healthy, they won't have disease. That's what I'm trying to, um, to concentrate on, the elimination of age-related dysfunction. If we eliminate that dysfunction, then we may live longer as well, but this is not my primary aim to live longer. If I live another hundred years, who is going to care? Yeah. But if we don't have age-related degeneration, then we, as, as a doctor, I think it's a good thing not to have diseases. Well, you are right, and that's exactly the logic. All these people who are working on either one pathway or two pathway use it. Nobody now says, except for Aubrey, maybe even he has cooled down. Nobody talks about the length of lifespan. They all talk about, we will take care of this disease, we will take care of that disease, and then you will get 
benefits yeah so so that way you have no disagreement with what these bezos and uh, calico or everybody else is doing they all want to say we will eliminate or the metformin trial by near brazil i and groups that's okay we will take care of this cardiovascular this diabetic so so that way they take reductionistic piecemeal interventions to help me yes if some drug makes me get off the bed and reach the toilet in time i would love that drug mm. whether it adds to my length of lifespan or quality of lifespan that will be secondary so so that means that in some ways where you are also supporting this big claim research by i was in this meeting just last week ardd all these uh, so many companies pushing things and they all talk about disease thing nobody wants to talk about lifespan anymore they use yeah. the word health span they have learned that don't if, talk if with the, numbers of us here yeah if these approaches are effective of course i support them but i i think they are not effective um, for example i see and, and it's not fair because Aubrey is not here um his approach has been the same since the year 2000 it's 20 years now and they haven't discovered anything useful for the people so therefore i have my reservations that something would be useful covering all aspects of aging not one disease we take metformin we may cover some aspects but they are not going to be all aspects of aging all put together but this is something that we need to see but at the moment i think it's not helping so um to push the conversation a little bit also we are uh, approaching the end of um, today's session i wanted to spend a little bit of time together to discuss uh, the cultural paradigm shifts um, if i can call it that way that need to happen uh, for us to to maybe we need to change how we see the, the value of life and the value of individual lives and how it can longevity uh, be translated into a, a long li meaningful life rather than a long a lens of how 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 long it, it is um, by age um, anyone wants to to discuss uh, marius do you want to to add a point or yeah, others think, we have it's very important to not to put too much emphasis on the length of life even if we live for many years without illnesses, or, which is not going to be possible. Nevertheless, to live for many years without contributing to the system, I think it's a waste. Um, if we do contribute to the system by making the system more robust and more able to develop and be more creative, then um, surely we have some value in this system and we we need to share it with other people. So we cannot do it alone. That's what I'm saying. We have to act in consideration with other people as well, preferably with as, as many people as we can. So the things I mentioned here as an example, uh, we need to do them and encourage other people to do them in the society as well, making society better in general. So kind of like a shift of consciousness uh, to to really look at uh, the system of life as a as something that can be maintained and should be maintained by individual parts and everybody's contributing to that uh, systemic uh, macro scale uh, maintenance and evolution. Yeah, that's how I see it. Yes, because life we have life for some reason life has has developed i don't know the reasons or who created it or why created it but the fact remains that we are alive and we are able to act uh, in a complex cognitive way and i think this has to be en en enhanced and shared with other people and help other people who cannot uh, act in this way up up their uh, cognition and contribution to society so yes it's a like a, a conscious uh, effort to improve all humanity yeah well, no, 
well, I would just like to say two words about that. That yes, this uh, looking at the evolution of human societies, complexities, human consciousness. So basically, for our uh, happiness and survival, what we need is a war-free world, a hunger-free world, uh, an inequality-free world. So when we change the paradigms, they are not just biological paradigm, it's a whole paradigm thing. So let's work on those things that will create possibilities and make our living even more attractive. War-free world, hunger-free world, and inequality-free world. Those are the big issues, big issues. <laughs> Agree with that. Yeah. I fully agree with you and thank you so much. Such a beautiful, um, um, I think, uh, note. Um, I would like to keep it in that note because uh, I think it was, uh, was really the perfect kind of conclusion added to this uh, interesting presentation of Dr. Marius Griazis. Um, thank you so much, uh, everyone, for participating today and being with us. Um, the videos are available on YouTube. I think you're now watching them on YouTube. So once again, please subscribe, like and comment our um, videos. And if you have any question, feel free to write them in the comment uh, uh, box. And also if you want to contact Marius or wants to know more about his work, uh, I think one of your slides had the contact this, uh, in the dispensable soma hypothesis uh, you can contact him and find more about his research and also you can contact us on the link that is put on the description box thank you very much and um, i wish you a very beautiful time bye bye thank you, thank you. bye